Scammers are stealing money from victims of all ages. We'll tell you how in this half hour. He did it again. A White Bear Lake firefighter collected thousands of items for families in need and just in time for the holidays. Hello, I'm Teresa Menarchuk. And I'm Ron Hawkins. Welcome to Lake Area Beat. White Bear Lake firefighter Jeff Lokes is constantly cooking up ways to raise money for charity. This time, he camped out near the fire station in downtown White Bear until he filled a truck with supplies for the food shelf. And no big surprise, residents of White Bear Lake and beyond came through. Photojournalist Scott Jensen has a story. When we first asked for donations from the food shelf, my uh, intention was to ask for food. Seems like that's what everyone does and just by the title I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And I was really surprised to hear them say that you know what we actually need now more than anything is toilet paper and toiletry items. And so they asked if I could kind of do something with that. So um, I put my brain to that and I thought I just thought of the title, I need toilet paper. Because normally you would look crazy if you stood on a corner and said that, but I could get away with it doing it in this fashion. Um, and I hoped maybe by Sunday afternoon or night that if I begged a few more people, I could get this truck just barely full. Never could have anticipated what happened. Um, very surprised, first of all, by how many people like me didn't know that they needed these things. And then to see how far people came, we had people from, you know, River Falls, Wisconsin, north of Anoka, Burnsville, after seeing stories, just bringing one pack. Uh, we filled the truck um, by Saturday afternoon and people are still dropping them off right now at the fire station, so it's just unbelievable. It's pretty remarkable how much he collected and actually, I, if I remember correctly, he was going to stay out there till Monday if he had to and then I saw he was only there through like noon on Saturday. Yeah, you know, he, well he started on uh, Friday. Friday night I know he was miserable, just, I mean, he was happy to be Cold out there and, and collecting yeah. Uh, connect, collecting donations and stuff. But yeah, he was freezing cold. It didn't get any sleep whatsoever. So he filled up the truck. It was a big truck. Uh, Donated by somebody? Yeah, Justin Nelson, one of our firefighters from uh, JD Construction, he donated the truck. Nice. Uh, and so yeah, he filled it up. And even after he left, there was donations being piled in. Yes, there were. I worked this weekend and we were getting calls, people looking for him on the corner and they couldn't find him. So we said, come on in. You can still, they were afraid that they had missed it. So oh. they wanted to bring stuff in. So they came to the fire station to drop the stuff out. So he probably actually could have filled one two and a half yeah. or two <laughs> Maybe. trucks. Yeah. But great job, Jeff. Yep. Awesome. We're going to take a quick break, but first. Here's Sergeant John Betty with some helpful traveling tips for the holidays. 2014 is quickly coming to a close, and along with it come the holidays. This means more travel on our roads, more parties, increased DWI patrols, and more potential for dangerous driving conditions. Hello everyone, I'm Sergeant John Vetti with the White Bear Lake Police Department. Here are some ways to stay safe while you're out on the roads this holiday season. In 2013, 17 people were killed in alcohol-related crashes in the month of November. That was the highest number of the year, followed by August and September. Thanksgiving Eve is a popular party night, as well as Thanksgiving Day being one of the busiest travel days of the year. Please plan for a sober ride if you're drinking during the holiday festivities. Allow plenty of time to get where you need to go. When driving conditions get snowy and slick, slow down. Drivers need to adjust their speeds according to the weather, as most non-fatal crashes occur during the winter months. And finally, as I told you last month, please buckle up. It's your best defense in a crash. Most any officer who's had to notify a family member that their loved one has been killed in a crash will tell you it's the hardest thing they've ever had to do. We want you to enjoy your holidays, but do it safely. I'm John Vetti, wishing you a safe and happy Thanksgiving.
Welcome back. It's impossible to escape news of the Ebola virus, but is it a real threat to us? An area infectious disease specialist talked about the realities of this deadly virus. You're not going to get it in the supermarket. You're not going to get it at the gas station. Uh, you're not going to get it at your kid's football game. Dr. Peter Bornstein is an infectious disease specialist for Health East. He says he's talked about the Ebola virus more in the last several weeks than the last several decades. I don't think that explains the white count going up, though. That's the, problem. the first cases of the virus began near the Ebola River in the Congo in 1976. Although its fatality rate is high at 90 percent, Dr. Bornstein says the risk of getting the virus in the United States is very low. I'm having flashbacks to October 2001 when we had uh, anthrax events following 9-11. And uh, at that time, if you may recall, that uh, several people were infected with anthrax in Florida and Washington, D.C., New York City. Uh, it was a real thing. Uh, people were scared. Panic was everywhere. Every time someone dropped a powdered donut, there was concern that it was anthrax. I think some of the airlines even banned powdered sugar for a while because people were so nervous. Uh, this feels exactly like that. There's no cure for the virus, which causes bleeding, dehydration, and diarrhea, but Dr. Bornstein says providing supportive treatment can be provided to those infected. And hospitals and medical staffs are working hard to prepare for worst-case scenarios. We have the ability to contain the infection. We have the ability to help people get through it. It's not insurmountable. Uh, it takes hard work. Infection prevention is hard work. It's costly. It's time consuming. It's something people don't think about until they need it. Um, the people at the Centers for Disease Control have saved countless lives, but they don't know who those are because when you're in a preventive role, you're saving the lives of people who will never be identified. Dr. Bornstein says the nurses in Dallas and the nurse in Spain are the first people ever to be infected with the Ebola virus outside of Africa. Rather than worrying about contracting the Ebola virus, he says more practical advice to take is not to smoke, get a flu shot, and wear your seatbelt. This is the second time I've had to deal with widespread panic about a novel process that people hadn't heard of before. Um, but we'll, get, we'll get through it. And of course, an extra precaution would be to wash your hands regularly and thoroughly. And that's just good advice to fight any virus, especially the flu, which can hit hard this time of year. And the doctor in the story said, make sure you get a flu shot. Well, scammers are constantly coming up with creative ways to steal from hardworking people. The latest scam promises a lottery winning or a prize of some kind. And unfortunately, people are falling victim. Sergeant John Betty is here to tell us more. And we get you in a piece that we taped earlier, and we get you in the studio today. Hey, double the pleasure. We're, we're lucky. <laughs> double the pleasure. <laughs> so now this scam, tell us about that. This, All right. Wh what are we talking about here when we talk about this lottery scam? I know I've taken several of them. Well, people are getting primarily phone calls from somebody saying, hey, you've won Publishers Clearinghouse, or you've won a big lottery. All you need to do is pay the taxes and the fees on this, and we'll send you the money. So people will ask, well, how do I send you the money? And they're directing victims to go buy a green dot money pack card. What this is, is it's a loaded credit card or debit card that you pay ahead of time um, in which you get a number assigned to the card. And the scammers will then ask you, what's the number on that card? And once you give them the number on the card, whatever you put on the card gets transferred over. For example, if a scammer tells me, you got to pay two hundred dollars for the to win this prize. I go into a store, maybe it's Walgreens, CVS, Walmart. I'll ask the clerk for a prepaid Green Dot Money Pack card. I'll hand them two hundred dollars cash plus a fee, and then they load your card with that money. Now, unfortunately, once you tell the scammer the code that's on the back of the card, the money transfers. They're able to enter that on their end. They get the money, and then the victim never receives a prize because it's all a big scam. And I've had actually some victims that never got rid of the card and thought that they were okay because they still had the card, but I had to explain that 
they can just use a computer and the money is all electronically transferred. Correct. So. The scammers are set up on their end to and be able to enter this code and the money transfers. And that's the principle of the card. It's for convenience so that you can make legitimate purchases online or through different companies. But unfortunately, scammers know this. And they used to always ask for wire transfers from Western Union or one of those banks. Now they're going to these prepaid cards and they'll even sit there on the phone with you actually talking to you through at the store saying, you know, yes, grab this card and make sure it says this and uh, we'll, they'll be patient and wait for you to load money on that card and then unfortunately after you s give them the code and the money transfers, there's no way to get that back. Now on the surface that sounds kind of funny. Why would somebody get money to, to receive money? Why would you go get money at the store to send somebody? What are some of the excuses that the scammers are using for the victims to give them money? Well, I think they just get psychologically drawn into it or they get excited that they want a prize or they've kind of built a rapport or relationship with the scammer and they just believe that, yes, I am going to get something. And we're telling people, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. You're not going to get a call randomly from some unknown person who tells you that you won a big prize or a lottery. Um, I think by telling them they have taxes and fees to pay, a lot of people think that's legitimate. The government probably has to, you know, you probably have to pay a tax to the government in order to receive this prize. So, because we've all heard of legitimate winnings um, where you have to pay a tax, you know, if you're on a TV game show or something, you got to pay taxes on that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, people honestly believe this, but we're getting calls almost daily from citizens, young and old, um, who are getting these calls or getting emails or targeted some way trying to get them to buy a green dot money pack. And if it involves the green dot, somebody you don't know, uh, take a step back and don't go through the process or the transaction because it's very likely a scam. Uh, I guess that's what I was going to ask. It sounds as though there's really no specific age group that they're targeting. They don't discriminate who they you know, want to scam. On the front end, it tends to be seniors more. And I think it probably is, but we've actually had some victims in which we've had some cases we're investigating where they're 19, 21, you know, early 20s, um, also being targeted. So I think scammers, whoever they think will give them some money, they'll go after. And you had mentioned that uh, uh, in these cases, when it happens, that person is just out of luck. Have you had any success whatsoever with uh, uh, charging these people or finding out who they are? That's a great question. Uh, our investigation division, our detectives are working with the Green Dot Money Pack company, um, trying to find out any information involving these transactions. Sometimes they're looking for IP addresses or phone numbers that may be involved. Um, the problem is if these scammers are overseas, especially in countries where they have no cooperation with U.S. law enforcement or U.S. government, uh, their victims are out that money. We can follow up as much as we want and we're just not going to be able to get it back because some areas they're not being held accountable on their end. And we are seeing a lot of these scams long distance. Um, we do have more luck with the local scammers, uh, but the ones that are overseas and stuff, it, it makes it tough. So prevention is the best way to get the word out to anybody and everybody, you know, not to fall victim to these scams. And so what are maybe some basic tips on, on what somebody should do? They pick up the phone and they hear a pitch that's similar to that and they think, oh, you know, I heard about this on Lake Area B. What should I do? Just hang up or, you know, what? Yeah. Uh... Don't engage in a long conversation. I would say, you know, I'm not interested. Thank you. Hang up the phone. If they continue to call, let them know. I believe this is a scam and I'm calling the police. Eventually, they will move on. They're not going to keep bugging you because it's a numbers game. If they call 100,000 people and 1% of the people uh, fall victim to this, you know, then they're making money. So they will move on because the more people they try to target, you know, the, their hopes are that they're going to find a new victim out there somewhere. Okay. Now, well, switching gears a little bit, you've got a safety presentation coming up for parents. What, what topics or what kind of things do you... Uh, are you going to talk about to the Yes, parents? we're very excited about this. On November 13th, we have Parent Safety Information Night, which is held at South Campus. Um, we're covering four major topics, the first one being current drug um, trends and awareness amongst our youth. Uh, we're covering internet safety um, and a lot of the issues with kids and computers um, and the applications that they're using on their phones. We're covering uh, teen driving laws. A lot of laws have changed in the last few years about how late 
kids can drive, uh, how many passengers they can have once somebody turns 16 and they get their license. And then we're covering healthy relationships and, and safe dating, which will also cover some um, bullying awareness as well. Kind of the main four topics we hear a lot of questions from parents about, and they're gonna be breakout sessions that are 45 minutes each. So a parent can go to one topic and then go to a second topic right after that because each session will be back to back. Or a couple of two could split up and try to make all four. Um, we're offering free pizza donated by Donatelli's starting at 5.30 p.m. in the cafeteria at South Campus. And then uh, the classroom instructions, the topics will start at uh, promptly six o'clock um, and we'll go from there. I know you want to see a huge turnout, but what happens if, if they can't make it? This isn't the only time that you put these presentations on. We're doing them once a year. Um, we're trying to gain more and more momentum. We just started this last year, so this is relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a good turnout the first year. We're hoping to double that or so. Um, if somebody can't make it, we can provide some of the information if they request it from us. Um, or like I said, we'll be giving these presentations again next year. And we want this to be an annual thing so that um, parents with their children up and coming in the grades can you know, attend to um, as, they, as they deem fit. And I'd recommend any parent that has either a um, middle school student or a student that's in you know, ninth through 12th grade really attend this. And even elementary students at that fourth and fifth grade, a lot of them are starting to make Facebook and Twitter and Instagram accounts. Um, you know, you, you worry about what kind of things are out in the community, bullying and um, some of the peer pressures with chemical use. It's, you start worrying as a parent as a young age and it's really good to get on top of this and kind of learn the current trends and what you can do to help keep your child safe. And those each of those topics are very, mm -hmm. you know, very important topics and And, and just for parents, don't mm -hmm. bring the kids, leave Right. The kids Unless on. you do need daycare, there will be daycare uh, present. So, um, but the presentations are intended for parents to kind of keep one or two steps ahead of their children. <laughs> and information is on the city's website if people forget the date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and check our police Facebook page at facebook.com, uh, White Bear Lake Police Department. Um, you will be able to uh, get all that information there as well. Great. Okay, well, thank you, yeah, Sergeant thank you. Betty. A lot of information. We thank appreciate you. it. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return... Men and women killed in the line of duty were remembered in a blue light ceremony. Welcome back. We're going to head to Fire Station 2 where I talk with a recent addition to the fire department. All right, we're back and we are at the fire station with Brent Bundy. Brent, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> uh, tell us how long you've been on the fire department now. Since August of last year. Okay. So. And now is being on the fire department, being a firefighter, being an EMT, is that something that uh, since you were a little kid you've thought about being or not necessarily? <laughs> kind of. Uh, I, I grew up in the medical field. My dad was a registered nurse pretty much my entire life. So I grew up hanging out in ERs and working on different floors in the ICU here and there. I was an EMT before I joined the Army. Mm -hmm. Figured it was kind of a career path I was going to go into. Then I went and joined the Army as a combat infantryman. Was a combat lifesaver for the four years I was there. Was discharged. Just kind of came back to it rather than finding something else to do. So. Okay. Well, great. And then how did you end up hooking up with White Bear Lake? When I was going through classes for my EMT classes, I was talking with some of my classmates. We were kind of bouncing around where we all wanted to land. I figured while I was going to continue going to school, I wanted to get a part-time job. Local fire department was paid on call, perfect fit. Okay. So Now, um, we have uh, people that are both uh, firefighters and EMTs on the department, people that are just uh, EMTs or paramedics. Mm -hmm. Where do you fall on that group? Right in between. <laughs> uh, I'm a nationally registered, I'm a licensed EMT. I'm also in the process of going through fire school right now, so I should be finishing that up in June. First week in June will be done. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm done with that, then I'll be a firefighter EMT. Okay, and then uh, so you've gotten a chance to do some training and some drills here with the fire department, mm -hmm. both on the fire side, right, mm -hmm. and also on the EMS side. Uh, 
A lot of times people tend to kind of gravitate to one side or the other. They really enjoy the firefighting and, you know, they kind of stick with the ambulance stuff and other people, they would far much rather be on the ambulance. Where do you fall on that? Again, probably right in between. Oh, um, good, okay. The fire side of things, the excitement, the adrenaline, the, okay, we're doing something now, mm -hmm. getting in there and doing something very physical. I love that side of it. At the same time, the whole reason for going through EMT is to help people. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's a job, but at the same time, we're going through it. If it was me on that end, I'd want somebody who knows what they're doing too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, kind of half dozen to one. Yeah. yeah. So. And I've been on some ambulance calls with you, mm -hmm. and you definitely are. are you've, you've got a great bedside manner, you know, <laughs> <laughs> chatting with the patients and putting them to ease. Uh, how about your family? Tell us a little bit about your family. See, my mom's a licensed counselor, um, lives down in Eden Prairie. My dad lives in St. Paul. Uh, right now he's working for a computer programming company that designs and develops programs for hospitals. Mm -hmm. So all their computer interface stuff is what he does. Mm. And I think his technical title is Computer Systems Technical Programming Analyst. Sounds good. With his background <laughs> of his nursing, it kind of helps. Um, then there's me. Uh, it's a firefighter EMT, and mm -hmm. I'm also a full-time student. My younger brother lives out in New York as a, uh, what do they call it, recording, technical recording artist. He runs a, a nightclub out there. Um, I wish I could tell you what it's called, but I can't. <laughs> You'll think of it in it, it'll, five it'll minutes. It'll come to me in about 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, my girlfriend's a paramedic here with Wiper as well. Okay, Becky, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Yep. Other than that, I have a five-year-old, and she is everything to me. Oh, so. okay. Does she ever get a chance to come out to the fire station and hang out with the trucks? Yeah, she, <laughs> she'll ask about once a week to come to the station and, and go rock around. With the Citizens Fire Academy, she actually got to go for a ride once oh. with one of our lieutenants. Oh, that's and great constantly says she wants to be a firefighter yeah. when she's older. Well, we'll definitely get her trained in by the time she's 18, right? Right, you know, I got 13 <laughs> more years to get her up, up to snuff. <laughs> All right, well, thanks a lot for spending some time with us here, Absolutely. Brent, and uh, back to you. The White Bear Lake Fire Department opened its doors for an open house last month. October kicked off fire prevention awareness, and people were invited to come out, see some fun stuff, and meet firefighters. How did it go? <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was fun. We had, I mean, the weather was great. And uh, there was a lot of different demonstrations. And truly, it's an, a good event for all ages. Mm -hmm. I mean, the kids come and they just have so much fun. They, I honestly think they learn a lot of fire safety tips, fire truck rides, and, you know, fun stuff like that. But, uh, you know, there's a, a variety of ages that show up and good information for everybody. I think you had a bouncy house? Yes, yes, <laughs> the cool looking fire, fire station and yeah. November isn't just the month of Thanksgiving, it's also a time to say thanks to our nation's veterans. Happy Veterans Day to the nearly 23 million brave men and women who've selflessly served this country. We leave you now with a look at how fallen officers are being remembered. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. We don't want people to forget those officers that have, have died in the line of duty or have been injured in the line of duty. Um, want to make sure that their families aren't forgotten. Saw the place where I could always stand The shoulder I could lean on This has been said that God has a plan for each of us. Yes, so then most would agree that God's plan for Josh that it becomes St. Paul Street Cop. Friends and co-workers would often comment that Josh's blood wasn't red like most. It was blue. Please blue. I think it's important for my children to celebrate who their dad was, to celebrate him as a hero and also as their father. Selfless with your life. It was something when Mike passed away and the, when I met Todd, it 
told them this is always going to be part of my life and my kids life and it's remembering their dad I never they were so young and I never want them to forget that I remember in the middle of the night getting the phone call from mom saying uh, Tom he's been killed um, and you, the first thing you think of is oh no not Tom Decker and of watch November 29th, 2013-12. And asked my wife. Sorry. To do one of the hardest things a police wife should ever have to do. I picked her up and I took her down. To tell a fellow wife that her husband was never to come through that door. Josh Paul, Philip Wino. End of watch. Sean Silvera. End of watch. Michael Pollock. Send them now.